Amen. Good morning, New Life. So good to be with you. My name is Shauna Rushing. I'm the pastor of small groups and communities, and it is absolutely a privilege to preach the Word of God to you this morning. And this series in particular, What is God Like?, that we're exploring through the season of Lent has specific uh, significance for me. God's been teaching me a lot through it. And actually, the scripture that we've been focusing on in Exodus 34, 6, really came alive and was highlighted to me in an amazing way at the end of seminary. I was at Uh, the final part of my second semester of biblical Hebrew, and my Hebrew professor wanted to take us to see this beautiful 500-year-old Torah scroll. And I don't know if you've seen a Torah scroll before. They're large. This one was probably about this big. It was in a glass case, temperature-controlled room to preserve it because it was so old and fragile. It's made of parchment, which is like animal hide that is very thin, and it's meticulously written in Hebrew characters and columns. There are no chapters or verses here, so it is not easy to find where you are and what you're looking for. So as we came up to this beautiful scroll, my professor was scouring over it, looking for this specific verse. It was open to Exodus 34, and as he's looking, I'm watching him, and I see tears begin to well up in his eyes. And friends, this is a man that is in Scripture every day. He teaches it in Hebrew and Greek. This is something, you know, that could feel normal. So it was amazing to see him just become so overwhelmed by this text, and he looked up at us and he said, this is one of the most precious texts in all of scripture because this is God's self-disclosure to us. He wants us to know, and he wanted the people of Israel to know what he's like. And then he began to read this text And it really pierced me deeply in my soul. And let's read it together. We've been reading it every week. Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in loyal love and faithfulness, keeping loyal love for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I love to hear your voices speaking the truth about who our God is. And I believe today that straight from the heart of God to your heart, he wants you to know and have a deeper revelation of who he is and specifically about his loyal love. That's what we're focusing on today. So let's pray before we talk about what that loyal love means. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a gift, what a privilege, what an honor to worship you and to have the words of Scripture that have been preserved for millennia so that we might know what you're like, so that we might know what you have to say to us May we not take that lightly. May we recognize what a treasure it is, your words of truth and life. And we pray, God, today that you would pour out a river of your Hesed love, a love that pursues us, a love that reaches us in the deepest parts of who we are. Would you help us to move from an intellectual understanding of that love to experiencing it today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may notice that there are two words that are repeated twice in this passage. The first is God's divine name. 
that he wants to emphasize who I am. And the second is this word loyal love, or in Hebrew, hesed, which has a throaty H that I'm not very good at saying, hesed. And it's actually my favorite Hebrew word. It is so captivating. It is in uh, the Old Testament 250 times, over half of those in the Psalms. If you have read even a little bit of scripture, you have encountered it. You just may not have known it. So let me give you a little sampling of where you may have seen it. One of our favorite Psalms, Psalm 23, the very last verse Let's put that slide up. I think it's the next one. Surely your goodness and hesed, your mercy, your loving kindness, your loyal love, it can't be captured in just one word, will follow me all the days of my life. That'll preach. His love is following and pursuing you every day of your life. How about Psalm 136, where 26 times God is reminding us and wanting us to recite over and over and over, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His hesed endures forever. There is no limit to his love. And then church, Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love hesed, and to walk humbly with your God. This is a beautiful truth and a word that I have been captivated by for about five years. And I could tell you a lot of stories about how God has met me in this word, but I'm only going to tell you one, okay? So I am one of those people, and you can judge me as you like, Uh, who likes to have a word for the year, all right? So the beginning of 2023, not this year, last year, I was out at my favorite spot. I confess, I am not a city girl, (laughs) y'all. I'm from Oklahoma. I like wide open spaces, and so I have to get out of the city. And my favorite spot is uh, Sands Point Preserve on Long Island Sound. So I'm out there on the beach in the middle of winter by myself because I'm the only one crazy enough to be there. And I'm asking God, what is your word for me this year? Is there something you want me to focus on, something you want me to know? And as I'm listening and different things are coming, this one word kept coming up and I kept shooing it away. Anybody do this? Something keeps coming up and you're like, no, that's not it. That's not the one. I want something different, Lord. But this word reach kept coming to mind. And I said, Lord, reach? What does that even mean, reach? And so as I'm walking, the scripture pops in my head. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. And you can see it. I realized after going to the psalm that this psalm is actually three stanzas talking about God's hesed love. How priceless it is. And over the course of the year, the Lord was showing me, Shauna, I know you think you know I love you, but you haven't even scratched the surface of my love for you. And there are parts of you that you're ashamed of, that you're hiding, that are so desperate to be cared for. And I want to reach you in those places. Friends, I wonder if anyone's come here this morning with a desperate heart. I wonder if any of you have some places that you've been hiding and guarding and closing off that you don't want anyone to see or to reach. I'm here to tell you today that God's hesed love is reaching for you in those places, in the places of addiction, in the places of anxiety and depression, In the places where you have decided, 
I am unworthy to be loved. That is right, right where God wants to reach you this morning. And right where he wanted to reach me in my desperate heart. So when I talk about this love that doesn't give up and that pursues and chase after us, I'm talking about it not only from the viewpoint of scripture, but because I have felt it and experienced it reaching out for me. And it's reaching out for you. So this word has said, you're going to see it all through the Old Testament, but it is absolutely found in the New Testament, particularly in the life of Jesus. And you know what Jesus says? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Colossians, our last series, it says, he is, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God is like, what do we need to do? We need to look at Jesus. We need to look at how he loved other people. We need to listen to how he taught and the way he taught. And one of the primary vehicles that Jesus used to teach are something called parables. And if you're not familiar with parables, they are a picture story. And these stories were not just cute little stories, little illustrations Jesus wanted to give people. No. These were stories that he was using to confront cultural and religious assumptions of the day. He wanted to confront the kingdom of the world and reveal his kingdom. And so today, I want us to focus on a set of parables. Jesus saw them as one, but it's actually three stories about the lost being found and coming home. And at the end of each of these stories, there was a party. Anybody like when the ending is a party? Right? I'm down, okay? Anytime I know there's going to be a party at the end, sign me up. So that's where, we ha where we're headed today, guys. We're headed for a party. But before we go there, let's talk about this experience of losing something. Anybody prone to losing things? You know what's hilarious? I talked about this in the first service and about how I'm always losing my phone, and I literally lost it uh, between services. I left it on that chair right there. It was still waiting for me. Thank God. And thank God for my Apple Watch and my Find My iPhone, which helped me locate it. So what about you? What are you prone to losing? Is it the glasses that are still on your head? Or the cup of coffee that you reheated that is still in the microwave? Maybe your earbuds? I don't know what it is, but I actually came across a study uh, that Americans spend $2.7 billion a year replacing things that they've lost. So that's about $50 a person that we're spending trying to replace things that we can no longer find. What do you think is the most uh, common lost item? They have a little graphic here I'm going to show you. So it's actually, uh, and this is the most com common items that get misplaced at least once a week. <laughs> the remote, okay, that's real, that's real. Phones are next. Uh, we've got house keys, yes. Shoes, glasses, oh my word, all of the things that I lose. Help us, Lord. <laughs> so I think Jesus realized that we have a tendency to relate with this idea of things getting lost and even with the experience of being lost ourselves. So he tells a set of these three stories that I mentioned and the first is the story of a shepherd with a hundred sheep and he loses one of them and he leaves the 99 in pursuit of the one and when he finds it, he puts it over his shoulders and he brings it home and he calls all the neighbors, and he invites them. He said, rejoice with me, because he's brought his lost sheep home. And there's a party. They throw a party. And Jesus said, there's more rejoicing in heaven over, over one lost one, over one sinner who comes home than this. 
And then he tells another story about a woman who lost a silver coin, and this silver coin was worth a day's wage. So just imagine, present day, you lost something that was worth a hard-earned day's work. You'd probably spend a lot of time looking for it, wouldn't you? So she's scouring her house, and of course, when she finds it, she celebrates, and just like the shepherd, she calls the neighbors and she throws a party. And the third story he tells is about two lost sons. And you may know this parable. You may have heard it many times, or perhaps this is the first time. It's often called the parable of the prodigal son. And as we talk about it this morning, I want to invite you to not shut down. Because sometimes when we listen to something familiar, we check out. I check out. But I believe God has something fresh to speak to us today through this parable. And particularly, there's some lies that these two sons believed that got in the way of knowing the truth about their father. They completely misunderstood and misjudged who their father was. And I know that I have misjudged my heavenly father. I've misunderstood who he is and his heart for me. I wonder if that's true for you. These two sons had obstacles in their way of being able to see the father for who he truly was. And friends, we have obstacles in our way, real obstacles like our family of origin. We talk about this a lot at New Life. We have had experiences uh, as children where we were loved imperfectly, where the model of love that was shown for us is that we have to perform in order to be loved, or that if we don't do what we're expected to do, that love is gonna be withheld. Or we experienced abusive love, We have all had a different experience that has tainted our view of what love truly is. And that makes it hard for us to be able to understand a love that doesn't give up. Because we've seen it give up on us. So how could this be true, Lord? Right? Hmm. We've also experienced trauma and wounding in the world, in this broken, broken world, not just from our family of origin, but from other people. That has made it hard for us to believe and trust. And all of those experiences have led to the formation, even though they're real, true experiences, they have led to the formation of false beliefs, of lies, of scripts, Stories we tell ourselves that get in the way of us being able to open ourselves to a love that is perfect. I know that is so, so true for me. Do any of you recognize obstacles in your own life to you being able to receive the love of God? I want to talk about this in the lives of these two sons And before we look at the text, I want to remind you of this story. So a father, a Middle Eastern Jewish father, had two sons, and the younger son did something that was so scandalous and unheard of in their culture and time. He came to the father, and he said, I want my inheritance now. Essentially saying, I wish you were dead. And what's almost even more shocking than the son's request is that the father said, okay. And it's not like he cashed out his 401k like we do now. He had to sell livestock, property, because that's where all of his wealth was. And as soon as the son got his hands on that money, he said, peace out. I don't want anything else to do with you, my father, my family, my community. 
I'm going to a far country where I'm going to find something better. Relatable, maybe? So when he goes, he ends up spending the money quickly, and he finds himself in the middle of a famine, away from his support. And the thing is, you might, or I might think, he would go running back quickly, but he was not willing because he knew how much he had shamed his family and his father, his community. And so it was going to take him getting to rock bottom before he was willing to go back. Again, relatable? Anybody had to get to rock bottom? Are you there right now? Before you're willing to go back to the father's house? But finally, he came to his senses because he ended up working for a pig farmer, which was one of the most shameful things someone of Jewish culture could do. And he found himself wishing he could eat pig slop and thought, you know, I'd be better off going home and being a servant for my father. I don't think I can be a son, but at least I could be a servant. And so he heads back home, and I want us to read the text here about how does the father respond. But while the son, the younger son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Let's stop there. In Middle Eastern culture, it was incredibly shameful for a person of this man's stature and age to run like this or to show their ankles, and he would have had to hike up his ropes and run. And you know what this father was doing? He wanted to make sure no one in the community would shame his son. He was going, when he saw the son coming, he was going to reach him before anybody else did and make sure that they would not shame him. The father shamed himself before he was willing for anyone to shame his son. Is that not what Jesus did on the cross? He took on our shame. He took on our shame. He takes on your shame. Let's keep going. So the son says, to the father I have sinned against heaven and against you I am no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants quick bring the best robe and put it on him put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet bring the fatted calf and kill it let's have a feast and celebrate here comes the party it's time for a party for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. They begin to celebrate. The father did not meet the son with shame. He took it on himself, and he met him with celebration. This is beautiful, and this is the way the father comes to us. But as I shared, there's some lies that this younger son had believed that kept him from really seeing the father for who he truly is. And I want to highlight those because perhaps you have believed some of these as well. The first lie that I think the son may have believed is the world has more to offer than my father's house. There are a lot of enticing, beautiful people and things out there and they're in front of us they're on our phones they're on the billboards boards they're in Times Square and they're telling us what we should be going after and so it's easy for us to buy the lie that the world has more to offer than my father's house and the son believed that too he also I think he believed I don't need the father's love He took for granted all that he had there, and he thought he could go to a distant country and find something better. Anybody looking for something better than what the love of God has for you right here? I know I have done it. I have done it. And he also believed, you know, because of the mistakes that he had made and the shame that he had brought on his family and his father, I am no longer worthy to be called a son.
Who of you have felt unworthy to return? You know what repentance is? It's returning home to the love of the Father. And he wants to let you know that you're worthy as a son and a daughter. As I shared earlier, there's not just one son, there's two. And both of these sons struggled to receive the father's love for them. Both of these sons misjudged the father. The the older son was so angry at his younger brother for doing this, for the way that he'd shamed the family. I think he may have been angry at the father too, that he allowed him to do it. And so he also had some lies or some scripts uh, that he was believing. And I want to read the text when he hears the party going on in the house. He's coming in from working all day in the field, and he's thinking, what is this? So he asks another worker, what's going on? And they said, your brother is home, and your dad killed the most expensive animal and is throwing a party for him. What do you think this older brother's response might have been in this moment? Let's read it. Let's read it. So the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, we don't know if this is true, comes home, he needs to learn clean fighting, you kill the fattened calf for him. And I can just see the father's response to him. The father went out to this son as well. He pursued the older son. He left the party to come to him. And I can see him putting his arm around the older son and saying, My son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found. He wanted the older brother to receive his love and the abundance of his house just as much as he wanted his younger son to experience that. And maybe you relate with the younger or the older son. Let's look at some of the lies that I think the older son believed. I need to be perfect to earn the father's love. This one hits me hard. I'm, a, I'm an oldest child. I can relate to this, and and honestly, God's been saying this to me a lot lately. I saw a clip on Instagram about things you should say to your kids, okay? And one of them is, you don't have to be perfect to be loved. And ever since I heard that, I feel like God's been saying it to me. Shauna, you don't have to be perfect to be loved. And the older son needed to, to learn that. The other thing I think he believed is, I must work to prove I'm worthy to be called a son. He thought it was about his performance. He also believed that the father was withholding from him blessing and celebration while all the while the father's saying, all of this is yours. You've always had access to this. And the father is saying that to us too. Those of us that have been serving and working hard for the Lord for a a long time, he wants you to know you don't have to be perfect to be loved. He's not loving you based on your performance. He's celebrating you, and he wants you to be able to stop and slow down so that you can actually see and receive it. Today. 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 And you know, we're talking about what is God like. And so Jesus is pushing on these assumptions that they have, right, of what God is like. He's wanting to expand their view of God, and he's wanting to expand our view of the truth of who God is. He wants to push back the lies that we've believed and come through with the truth of God's hesed love. It's a relational 
covenant, faithful love, even when we're not faithful, even when we're in the far country. His eyes are fixed on the horizon, looking, waiting for us to just turn. And the second we decide to come home, because he's not going to force us to stay home, that's free will and that's love. But the second we turn, he's running to us. He is running to you. And today, I believe that he wants to give us a fresh revelation of that love. Not only for ourselves, but for people in our life who are very challenging to love. We need the grace, the supernatural Spirit-given grace to love particular people in our life. I need it. Anybody else? And I've been hearing stories this past week from you all. I've been hearing stories of people who are caring for their aging parents. And that parent is particularly cruel. And they need God to impart his hesed love to them so that they can continue to care for them. And I've been talking to teachers. Teachers who are trying so hard to show the love of Christ through their actions and the way that they respond to their students, but the students are giving them a hard time. And they need a fresh injection of God's hesed love to be able to extend. Where in your life do you need God not only to give you an understanding to reach the parts of you that you think are unreachable, but also to help you to love others with that kind of love? That's what I want to ask God for, and I want to ask the worship team to come up. And I want to read a poem to us. You all, if you've heard from me before, you know I like art and poetry and prayer, so we already heard Sophia's amazing poem. I have one more for you. This is by K.J. Ramsey, and you might want to close your eyes and just let the words sink in. God leaves behind the 99 pretty, pleasant parts of you to find the one part of you that feels the most unlovable. There is no part of you that the good shepherd will not seek and follow to extend goodness and love. There is no part of you that is too broken, too angry, too irritable, too anxious, or too lost for God to seek. The shepherd searches over ridges and rocks, he calls out your name, through his vo though his voice begins to crack. There is no looming storm or heavy rain that can call off his search. He wipes sweat from his brow and keeps stepping through the dirt. His breath has gone stale. His stomach growls from missed meals, but the shepherd is resolved. He will not stop. God's goodness and Hesed hunt you harder than a lion or a bear. They follow you and track you longer and farther than any harm. This shepherd is relentless to recover the parts of you that are lost. He will not leave behind the beauty that others have cursed. And when he finally finds the most shamed parts of you, he stops stoops down to the ground and through briar and branch hooks his staff around your neck and gently pulls you back. No matter how muddy or dirty your wool, he wraps his hand around your waist and lifts you across his shoulders. He knows you're too weak to make it home on your feet, but he doesn't mind. You're his sheep. What he loved was lost, but what was lost he found. The wounds that took you out to the wilderness are simply the mark of your worth to him. To God, our good shepherd, there is no larger joy 
no bigger party than bringing you home. You can count on it. More than anything you will ever do for God, God delights in finding every lost part of you. You can count on it. Now I want to invite you, if you're comfortable, to open your hands. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray right now for a new, fresh understanding of who you are, God. We pray that you would remove every obstacle and every lie that's getting in the way of us seeing you for who you truly are, God. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in enduring, loyal, faithful love. May we know that, and may it reach the most lost parts of our hearts. And God, we also pray for those people in our life that we don't have the strength to love. We don't have the heart to love. God, we're asking for you to impart your heart of hesed into us, that we may have the grace to love and to continue to love those you're inviting us to serve and to bless and to show what you're like. We thank you, God. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for not giving up on me, God, and for reaching my most desperate places. Would you reach every desperate heart and place in this room today? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and respond.